Uh, hello, uh, my name is Dr. Kenneth Fang. I am the uh, chairman of the uh, Department of Cardiovascular Services and the uh, division chief of cardiothoracic surgery at Banner University Medical Center in downtown Phoenix, Arizona. I have been tasked today to uh, discuss a uh, novel approach for patients with severe mitral valve stenosis in the presence of severe mitral annual calcification. This is an operation that's been now called a transatrial valve and MAC TMVR procedure. Uh, these are my uh, financial disclosures. You know, when you look at the uh, mitral valve stenosis, uh, the treatment for mitral valve stenosis and mitral valve replacement has been around for decades. Uh, countless number of uh, patients have had improvement of their quality of life, as well as increase in the length of their lives with this operation. I would say that in the realm of the technical aspect of the operation, uh, it's low complexity. I venture to say that uh, almost every cardiac surgeon uh, in the United States and beyond knows how to do a mitral valve replacement for uh, mitral stenosis. However, when you throw in the complexity of severe mitral annual calcification, i.e. MAC, all of that changes. Uh, most surgeons, given severe mitral annual calcification, like you see in the diagram on the right, uh, would probably deem this patient, these patients, inoperable. God forbid if you were to find this in the operating room because your preoperative analysis wasn't thorough enough, this probably would lead to what we call a peak and shriek operation, open, close, abandoned operation. So the question is, what are the challenges to severe mitral annual calcification that leads to this type of a response? Well, it probably falls in the uh, region of uh, complications, much higher complications when there's severe MAC around versus not a, a lot of uh, mitral annual calcification. And I would say that the complications kind of fall into two categories. Uh, the first category is you go in there and you just don't remove enough of the calcium. If you don't remove enough, enough of the calcium, well, you end up putting a smaller valve in, downsizing of it. If you put a smaller valve in, then you lead to persistent high gradients across the valve. So you really haven't done a lot for the patient. If you put the valve in, in a calcified base, the valve's not going to seat properly. If that happens, you're going to have a higher rate of perivalvular leak. Not just putting the valve in, but you're not going to put sutures through this calcium that over time can break through to lead to uh, perivalvular leaks that are developing over the course of months to years. So, so clearly, that's not a great option. Now, on the other side, if you go in there, you develop, uh, debris too much of the calcium, well, there's complications associated with that as well. Typically, if you do read too much of the calcium, well, you still got to get that valve in place. So you tend to take wider bites with your sutures. Well, there's a lot of structures around the mitral valve annulus. And when you start taking wider bites, you can injure circumflex artery and or the aortic valve. Probably the biggie here is that if you do read too much of the calcium, especially in your area of the posterior annulus, you can cause a rupture of the atrial ventricular junction. The reason why this is so feared by heart surgeons is because it can carry up to a mortality as high as 75%. This picture kind of gives you an idea of the anatomy. You can see that with the mitral valve in the center there, if you take bites a little bit too wide, anywhere between P1, P2, and portions of P3, you can get the circumflex artery. In the region of A2, if you take bites too far there, you can actually put a needle through the aortic valve, causing aortic valve insufficiency and injury. So clearly there's significant structures around this area that can cause a problem. So this is a real problem, right? Real problems require novel solution, inventive solutions. So, you know, we came up with the idea of doing valve, uh, I'm sorry, do, from doing transcatheter mitral valve replacements uh, in early 2015. In fact, we've performed our very first valve and ring TMDR with a transapical approach utilizing a sapient XT valve in April 16, 2015. Since that time, we've uh, performed almost 100 valve and valve, valve and ring, valve and MAC TMDR procedures at our institution. It was through this work that we were fortunate to be invited by Dr. Myron Guerrero to be part of her mitral implantation uh, uh, mitral trial. Um, we, the investigators, realized that, well, you know, this procedure is pretty damn good for valve and valve, not bad for valve and ring. FDA has already approved 
of valve and valve procedures. But what we all realized was that valve and MAC was the least successful. Now, what's the reason for that? When we think about it, the mitral valve aglus is typically pretty big, and we're utilizing a aortic valve for a mitral position. So that quite often leads to a higher rate of peripheral, uh, perivalvular leaks and a higher rate of catastrophic valve normalization. Because we're putting this valve inside a native valve, the native anterior leaflet can get pushed in and cause left ventricular alpha tract obstructions. And quite often, this can be catastrophic. We learned this early on within our first five cases. <clears throat> so what's the difference with transatrial? Well, transatrial, you got to remember, is a open heart operation. Now, a lot of these patients are sent to me by referring cardiologists. Uh, maybe they found me online or something like that. And you know, the, the kind of the moniker of TNVR, a lot of people think, well, this is like tablet. This is just a stick in the groin, you get to go home the next day. So even if you're really sick, you can still have this operation. But the reality is that this requires a sternotomy or thoracotomy, cardiopulmonary bypass, and most of the time, cardioplegia cardiac arrest. So this is open heart surgery. So you have to be a candidate for open heart surgery to have this procedure. Why is this transatrial better than let's say percutaneous or transapical? Well, because it allows the removal of barriers that makes percutaneous transeptal and transapicals very difficult with high complications. What can we do? Well, first of all, we can remove the anterior leaflet, and thereby minimizing the potential for catastrophic left ventricular alpha tract obstruction. We can place felt strips around the base of the uh, sapien valve to give it more girth, and then we can put sutures through the walls of the left atrium and bring it into the uh, uh, sapien valve and therefore uh, minimize the chance of perivalvular leaks and minimize the chance of catastrophic embolization. This operation has been around for a while. Uh, uh, Professor Carell with his colleagues in Switzerland reported in 2012 their very first successful transatrial TMBR procedure in presence of MAC with a sapien XD valve. This was actually an operation that started off as a routine uh, surgical uh, tissue mitral valve replacement, but when they got in there and saw how much calcium there was, they abandoned that procedure and came up with the idea of putting a sapien XT in. Four years later, uh, Dr. Marasita and his colleagues at University of Missouri uh, actually published their first planned transatrial TMBR and MAC with a sapien XD valve as well. During that time, since that time, a lot of surgeons have created a lot of various techniques to do the same procedures with one of these uh, balloon expandable valves. The problem is that because of the variation in the technique, there was a lot of inconsistent outcomes. Now, <clears throat> the members of this uh, Mitro trial felt that uh, we needed to do something to create a more unified, modified technique to do this procedure. Uh, taking a cue from Dr. Myron Guerrero, who previously had published uh, a similar uh, paper going through the step-by-step -step methods of doing a valve and valve transeptal TMBR procedure. Uh, uh, Hyde Russell, one of our colleagues, uh, published this paper in uh, Jack 2018, basically showing the same thing but for the transatrial approach. We utilize a Sapien 3 valve, we place a one centimeter felt strip around the valve base, we uh, orient the valve so that it's placed properly within the mitral valve annulus with uh, or, uh, orientation sutures placed at the sapient valve commissures. We anchor the valve by placing sutures through the wall of the left atrium. And finally, like I said before, we remove the anterior leaflet to minimize the chance for uh, left ventricular alpha tract obstruction. When these patients are presented to us, we have to have certain preoperative considerations. Again, you know, this is not a stick in the groin type of procedure. This is open heart surgery utilizing a transcatheter valve. So the question is, can these patients have open heart surgery? If they have liver failure, if they have severe COPD or a lot of comorbidities that creates a STS of 15, 20, 30%, well, if they're not really candidates for open heart surgery, they're not a candidate for a transatrial approach. Standard workup is usually a transthoracic gecko plus or minus a transesophageal echo. Everyone gets cardiac catheterization to the uh, rule out coronary artery disease. And probably the most important aspect of the preoperative workup is a cardiac CTA. Utilizing various commercially available software, we can use the CTA to estimate 
the mitral annular area. We can also estimate the post-deployment left ventricular outflow tract area, which now become known as the neo-LVOT. As far as the technique, well, we utilize the safety valve that you see here. These are one of the uh, pictures of my procedure. Um, safety valve is wrapped with a one centimeter felt strip. If you need more girth, you can see that you can kind of give it more girth by wrapping it a little bit more. Utilize a four proline suture to sew the valve, uh, felt strip in place with the valve. We use two F bond sutures that you see here, placed at the commissure where the leaflets come together. And then when we're all done, we can crimp this valve to about 25 to 50% of the uh, natural uh, width in order to put the valve inside. Now, some of my colleagues, what was described in a recent paper, uh, have uh, crimped this valve on top of the balloon and then inserted it as one apparatus. But I, I find it easier to, to make sure that the orientation of the valve is correct by crimping it, putting the sutures in, securing that, and therefore, when you expand it less, versus a complete crimping on the balloon, I believe that it's less likely to rotate within the uh, annulus itself. Remember, again, this is a open heart operation. Sternotomy, thoracotomy, cardiopulmonary bypass, cardioplegic arrest, and if you can't either cross plant the aorta because of calcium or you can't get access to it from a redo thoracotomy, well, then you can also do rapid ventricular pacing, which we have done multiple times. Uh, valve prep is usually done after cannulation, but before initiation of cardiopulmonary bypass. The reason for that is because, you know, it can take five to 10 minutes to prep this valve before uh, crimping of it. So why waste cardiopulmonary bypass time? So we typically do a tsunami, cannulate, heparinize, and go to the back table, prep, and then once that's all prepped, then we initiate cardiopulmonary bypass and do everything else. First thing we do when we look at the valve is we resect the anterior leaflet. Like I said, we can resect all the leaflet or part of the leaflet, depending on the annular size that's uh, predetermined on CTA to uh, allow the valve to fit better. We crimp the valve and then we usually do this at the back table like you see here and then insert the entire thing. The importance of these commercial sutures, well, we place them typically at the two, six and 10 o'clock position. The valve is crimped and inserted into the annulus and these sutures are placed through this area and then secure with tourniquets to prevent rotation of the valve during the deployment process. The importance of uh, the valve uh, positioning, as you can see on this uh, uh, cartoon here, if the sapient valve is put in at commissure to commissure, during systole, that leaflet will come down and then minimize the chance for LVOT obstruction. But if you rotate that valve slightly so that the commissure is in the region of A2, during systole, that portion won't collapse down and therefore there's a greater chance that you can actually obstruct. So you can see that this area right here is very important to keep away as far as having the strut in this area. Once it's secure with the tourniquets, the balloon is inflated and, or I'm sorry, the balloon is inserted and we inflate the balloon to a predetermined volume that's based on the preoperative CTA assessment of the annular size. The larger the annulus, the more saline you wanna put in there. You know, we, we've gone up to as high as five, uh, uh, CC's extra in these uh, 29 millimeter balloons. I think when you start getting to like the five or 10 CC range, that's when you run the risk of rupturing the balloon. We've actually done that by uh, putting uh, as much as 10 CC's in. When we're all done, we look at the valve, we remove the tourniquets, we secure the sutures, usually with core knots, and then we look at the valve and see how it's seated. Uh, we then place these pledged ethamon sutures where we bring the wall of the left atrium down to the valve itself, and when we do that, we kind of secure it better, and then we can try to prevent perivalvular leaks. Typical areas where perivalvular leaks would uh, occur is near the commissure of the native mitral valve. So I tend to put more sutures in that area. Uh, my, some of my colleagues will put in sutures circumferentially, just like they're sewing in a uh, mitral valve through the uh, mitral valve annulus. But I feel that uh, that's unnecessary, and if you do it selectively, you can have very good results as well. As far as the results of the procedure, uh, I'm not really aware of uh, any uh, uh, published data specifically for transatrial procedures. Uh, probably the closest thing is uh, Mara Guerrero created this uh, TMDR and MAC Global Registry, uh, registry that we were actually involved in. And uh, just uh, in 2018 in Jack, we published the one-year results. Out of 116 patients that had the TMDR and MAC, uh, 
90% or greater uh, actually had a sapient XD or sapient 3 valve. Procedural success was about three out of every four patients. Uh, percentage of patients that had hemodynamically significant LVOT obstruction was 11.2%. Valve embolization occurred in 4.3% of patients and significant uh, uh, MR, usually perivalve relief, was in about 5%. The 30-day and one-year all-cause mortality, unfortunately, was quite high. 25%, 53.7% respectively. You gotta remember, these were very sick patients. The average STS of these patients was 15.3%, plus or minus 11.6%. These are sick patients that even if they were to have just routine operations without the presence of MAC, had a very higher likelihood of dying from this operation or any operation. So that can kind of partially explain the high numbers, but still, this is clearly very concerning and why uh, valve and MAC is uh, something that uh, needs a lot of scrutiny still. Out of these 116 patients, it should be noted that only about 20% of them actually had transatrial. The vast majority had a transseptal approach. Now, my own personal results, uh, since February 2018, uh, I've done 15 of these operations. 100% uh, of the time, it was uh, a sapient three valve. We've had 100% procedural success. We had zero LVOT obstruction. We've had zero valve embolization we had zero uh, significant mitral valve regurgitation. Uh, unfortunately, our 30-day uh, all-cause mortality was very similar to the global registry, which was 26.6%. So in conclusion, I think that the transatrial valve and MAC TMDR procedure is a feasible operation. I think it can be done with very high procedural success rate if done properly. Uh, unfortunately, it does have a very high 30-day mortality of 25%. However, I do believe that it is a viable option for properly selected patients that would otherwise be deemed inoperable. And um, when you look at my own results, most of the deaths, well, all the deaths were really in the early part of the uh, 15. In my last six operations where the STS number was lower, where the only reason why we were doing this operation was because of severe MAC and not a lot of other comorbidities in these properly selected patients, I think that we can potentially have a much lower mortality associated with the operation and do this operation in a much safer fashion. Thank you very much.